Welcome everybody. Um, this is the Fire Safe January 2023 um, meeting, and we have two local presenters this morning. Um, Debbie Mendelson uh, is our first um, presenter. Uh, she is uh, what I consider an activist for uh, saving oak trees from SOD. Um, she's been instrumental in that uh, in that challenge. Um, she's the chair of the Peninsula SOD Blitz, um, which, she's, which she helped start implement, I think going back into 2008. Um, and she continues uh, the fight um, and, and uh, she works directly with um, our friend, Matteo Garbliato, who um, we all know and um, have heard his presentations. And so I've invited her here to talk about, you know, summarize what the Blitz is, uh, the information they're gathering, how it's helping, and potentially any uh, updated information she has um, on SOD in our uh, immediate, you know, San Mateo County area. Uh, so, uh, Debbie, um, with that, if you want to... Hey. Uh, go ahead and start, and I um, I can add those um, links in the chat that you sent me if you'd like me to do that. I would like you to do that. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for being here, and I hope I can persuade some of you, if you don't participate in SOD Blitzes, to participate. Uh, the, actually, uh, uh, Denise is correct. It's been since about 2007. Uh, California Oak Mortality Task Force and UC Berkeley got together when Dr. Uh, Mateo, I think if you know him as Mateo, um, who I call lovingly the father of sods. I don't know that he necessarily appreciates that, but a sudden oak death, Phytophthora morum, was discovered in the 1990s. And then they started, uh, Matteo and another group started what has been labeled the largest citizen scientist project in the United States. And started, discovered in the 90s, the program started in about 2007. This will be our 16th year. And what we do is we ask people to come together in the spring, usually after the rains and take packets in up until the pandemic, Mateo actually went to every community where there's a, an organization for the Blitz and would make a presentation. Now he presents a video where you can go online, but you go to, in our case, we put packets at uh, Los Altos Hills, Portola Valley, Woodside, uh, Emerald Hills participates, Burlingame participates. Actually there's 24 uh, groups that participate from uh, Del Norte, Humboldt, up in Humboldt to San Luis Obispo. Uh, they are run in the springtime where you go out and you take samples of the number one inoculant, which is bay laurel. So you take the leaves from bay laurel, not, not the oak trees, but the bay laurel. And um, actually now we've added more. There's uh, 81 new hosts, 81 hosts of Phytophthora. The distinction is the Phytophthora, the sporangia does not kill the bay laurel but it can kill the oaks, the evergreen oaks. And we've witnessed, I'm sure you've seen Denise up in Hutter Park, the just wipeout of tan oaks up there. Uh, as far as um, this year, it's also now present on sword ferns. And unfortunately, one of our great natives around here on the peninsula, the Toyon. Um, 2022, it's a great thing to say, was the lowest level of, of uh, saw it in 15 years of their doing lab research. And that's obviously because of the drought, because the Phytophthora is a, a sporangia that it replicates in water and is spread more prevalent when there's mm -hmm. rainfall, less mm -hmm. prevalent when there's drought. That doesn't mean that it dies. It means it goes dormant. So, you know, God help us after this, these storms and this spring and what we will discover. Um, in 20, just to give you some specifics that I've written down here, as an example, this last year, there was 6,696 trees sampled. I'm proud to say that 2,188 of those were on the peninsula. And I, if anybody cared, I could divide that out because the labs divide the peninsula in north, south, east, and west. Most surveys have been done west because it's very prevalent up by Skylanda and on the, on the ridge. Um, 
the, for 2022, uh, the positive tree rates was 7.1%. Statewide infection was 2.9%. And the oak mortality was 14.3%. Um, another program that's relatively new that didn't was not at the inception of SOD is the Oak Step program, Oak SOD testing program. I don't know who created that acronym because it's really kind of off, but um, and it's for licensed tree care professionals. So the Berkeley Lab will provide free the petri dishes, a video mm -hmm. explanation of how to test. Now this, the difference between this and the blitzes and the blitzes, we're testing bay laurel leaves of bay laurel. With oak step, you're actually testing the oak tree. Uh, but it's for professionals. Like I said, the, the, the lab provides you all the equipment and then you, you know, whether it's McLenahan or whatever tree company has their arborist go, if they have clients, they can use this, this methodology, the lab, and then you pay a fee and the lab provides a written uh, analysis of the, the sampling that was taken. That's Oak Step. Uh, I did provide Denise with all of the, um, all the websites, mateolab.org. You can see past videos, you can see explanations, you can see, you know, videos of people doing testing, videos of the lab. There's also the um, sodmapmobile.org. That's what we when we go out to do the testing, you can take your phone, you can see if you're in an area and how much sod is prevalent around you and where it is. It, it pinpoints every tree that's been tested in the entire state. And if I didn't mention, another thing to consider is that for those of you that may not know, originally sod came in from Europe. So it's called EU1, that strain. It came in, uh, we believe on a rhododendron and it came into a nursery in Scotts Valley. Now there is coming from Oregon, another strain of sod called NA1, North American. Uh, the fear has, has been, you know, Mateo's made a face like if in common terms, if NA1 marries blue one. I'm sorry, what? Pardon? Oh, um, I'm using my phone. Uh, I'm muting him. If NNA1 marries EU1, it's yet to be determined what would happen there. Um, the good news is there's, they've been testing in San Francisco. There's never been a case of uh, finding Phytophthora remorum. There are many Phytophthoras, but the one we're talking about is Phytophthora remorum that in San Francisco and test as far south as San Luis Obispo and there hasn't been any in San Luis Obispo. Carmel Valley, all the way up, a lot on the peninsula. Let's see, what else can I tell you? You know that the, the pathogen effect. Fitzgerald that I think we could probably join. You see, Debbie needs to unmute herself. Can you do that, Casey? Debbie needs to unmute. He muted all. Yeah, there was so much noise going on. Hey, now can you hear me? Did you hear me before? From the beginning or? No, the last statement you'll have to repeat. Oh, okay, great. Oh, because I'm going to say you guys don't want to hear all that over over again. Um, what I was saying was that the oak trees for those that don't know, it's not, it does not affect uh, deciduous oaks like the, the lobatas, but it's Quercus agrifolia, tan oak, which isn't a true oak. And currently the methodology to protect your tree as the Berkeley lab indicates is to use gypsum on the ground around your oak about two to three back, feet back from the trunk, spread it maybe two to, two, two, three, two to three pounds around the tree, wait a couple of weeks, and then depending on the circumference of your tree, either inject your tree with agrifos or topically apply agrifos mixed with pentabark as the surficant. And uh, you, you only need, originally they were saying every year, now they're saying you do that application every other year and you only do it, timing is very important both because of how the xylem and the phloma and how a tree works, 
at the end of November through early December. Um, That's about, I mean, other than the fact that there are new trees that are madrones and manzanitas are now uh, carrying sod. As I said, the Toyon up near the Northern border, they found it on sword ferns. Hmm. All right, well, I wanna um, open it up <clears throat> for questions. Um, and one thing I want to ask you, Debbie, a um, long time ago, um, Mateo came out and he did a demonstration and we recorded it and put it on a video of him actually treating trees. Uh, yes. Remember at the amount of patrol grounds. And right. um, we should, I should probably try to find that. I might even still have it's, a copy. It is, it is on, uh, at the MateoLab.org. Okay. You'll find every presentation Mateo has done, including okay. one of the results. He did a, a thing in November. Oh, that's the other thing. There's always the blitz where we would really appreciate help of people coming out taking packets, even if you're just doing your own property. Every tree you do, in this case, bay laurel that you test is a help. And then in November, he still does, although he does it by video like this because of pandemic, um, you know, an analysis of what the results were from the, the surveys that we did in the spring. And he's still doing that. Okay, so if you could send us, um, if you can send me um, information when that comes around in 2023, I'll post it for all of our fire safety members. Good. Um, and I will try to get that, uh, I'll look up that video. I think I actually still have a CD of it and I'll put it on our website. Um, so that information um, is out there. You know, I, I wanna just make note that many of our fuel reduction projects that we're doing now and that we have been doing uh, deal with a tremendous amount of SOD debris. You know, so these trees are dying, we're going in, we're doing the fuel reduction and just massive amounts of dead, you know, uh, SOD trees. And a lot of times what we'll do is that, um, you know, we haven't, haven't tested them and we're assuming that they're SOD, um, that we'll, when it comes to doing the chipping for them and things like that, we'll go to those trees last if we can so that we're not having to, you know, sanitize the chipper and, you know, because when we do a fuel project, you know, we're, we're trimming and cutting, you know, many trees at the same time um, during the day. And so a lot of times we'll do the SOD trees um, last, you know, the oak trees last. And, you know, and we always make sure for the most part that either we're leaving that right on site that, you know, what we chip or we, we send it to a certified and um, maybe Sheena knows, uh, or maybe you know, Debbie, it used to be that when you actually worked on a SOD tree, you're not supposed to remove the wood out of county. It's kind of a quarantined um, item and, and it could go to a certified um, refuse. Um, and I think Ox Mountain was uh, one of the certifi certification sites. So, but, um, you know, it, it is causing an issue um, with our fuel projects. And a lot of times we'll leave the large trunks because they're so large and we'll just, you know, um, get the more of the smaller woody uh, de debris. Um, and I don't know if, if Sarah or Rich want to comment <clears throat> on this um, or anybody else who's on the call who has done, you know, large fuel reduction projects and has been inundated with an SOD kind of mess. Can I just say, Two things. One, it's 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 always been, and Matteo has never ch told me differently since the inception that you you cannot identify sod without te the lab test. Hence the Oak Step program, where you're actually testing from taking samples of bark from a tree. That's one. Two, I have always been told that when the material goes through the chipper, what comes out because of the heat, apparently that ends up happening when you're chipping that wood, that that would kill the pathogen. That's what I have been taught. Mm -hmm. And three, in the old days, in the good old days, the county in San Mateo County, if you thought you had sudden oak death, they would send someone out from the Department of Agriculture. That happened on my property. It took two weeks. He came, took the sample. It took two weeks to get the results. They don't, they don't do that anymore. They, I guess they don't have money for that anymore. But if you do have anybody individually has tree work done, or a, a sudden oak death, so to speak, tree removed, uh, you know, be sure, be sure that it is burrito wrapped, tightly wrapped so that stuff is not flying off of a truck going down the highway. 
And yes, it can't be transferred from one work done can't with sudden oak death is not supposed to, because I was at a seminar for the Department of Forestry, it's not supposed to cross county lines. So what's in San Mateo County can go to, as far as I still know, um, Ox Mountain, I was gonna say Oak Mountain, no, Ox Mountain, it can go there and um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Richard from Bay Retreat Specialist is on the call. Um, Rich, did you want to comment and kind of what your practices are? Um, yeah, um, great. So a question I had is, so is, is the black nodules that we see on oaks, tan oaks, madrone, is that a definitive description of Phytophthora sudden oak death? Because um, I've been uh, assuming that when we see the black nodules, oh yeah, that's sudden oak death. Is any, can anyone comment whether that's a definitive uh, ID for sudden oak death? No, that's not. Sorry. It's like secondary <laughs> pathogen. No. Oh, it's a secondary pathogen, okay. Well, that's good. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of the entities we work with, um, if there's sudden oak death on that site, we, we don't off haul it at all. They don't want it transported. And so we, for the most part, that's what we do. Um, and then another question is we will transport material straight to Stockton DTE burn plant where they burn it for electricity. And so I'm, I'm, I have a question about whether that would be a viable um, source to remove it safely. Um, I can speak to that. So you are allowed to move it over county lines, if, like following those very safe protocols, which I'm sure you do with the, make sure the material is covered and you probably um, deliver the papers when you get to the green, green waste facility, right? And then when it's at that high heat, it does kill it. But it's for, um, yeah, there's very strict um, rules about transporting it to make sure that it doesn't get dropped off where it's not supposed to go directly to the green waste facility. Yeah, uh, one one amateur um, thing that I have recognized with SOD is, it, you know, granted, you know, you're not going to test every tree. There's just a bunch of debris on the ground, and you're trying to figure out, you know, what the tree died from. Is if a lot of times you just pick up one of the branches and it feels like super lightweight, like you know, you can pick this log up that you should not be able to pick up. You know that the tree has been totally dehydrated um, from the, you know, the symptoms and the characteristics of the disease. Um, to me, that is always kind of a, it's been a telltale of, hey, this tree died of SOD. Because uh, it, it really, um, it just dehydrates the whole tree's vascular system. It's not able to suck up any of the water. Um, so Nikki Hansen has a question. Are all the plants which are considered hosts um, also able to infect oaks in the same way that bay trees are able to infect oaks? Well, my answer to that would be yes, because the, the problem is the sporangia, it's the phytophthora, which is a waterborne, you know, pest, waterborne pathogen. And uh, like I said earlier, I, you know, because I, I just asked Dr. Schmidt yesterday, who works with Mateo, because Mateo is actually on sabbatical right now. Um, when we've had the drought, does that mean there's nothing to sustain Phytophthora and therefore it dies? And the answer is no, it just goes dormant when there's no water, no moisture to carry it. So um, yeah, it's, it's there. Right, so it's a physical uh, transformation. Yes. Yeah, yeah right. Well, and I always wondered about the squirrels and the birds and the things like that. I, I know for a while there, you know, they were saying horses and people can um, spread it, you know, walking on the trails and things like that. But it seems to me that the squirrels and the birds would, um, you know, be able to transfer it pretty easily. Well, that's a very um, good question. I, I have At not least my squirrels. 
Yeah, and I have a million squirrels. Oh yeah, my squirrels are very active. They're almost, you know, they jump from tree to tree to tree, um, from the oaks to the bays. So um, I've tried to warn them about SOD, but they don't seem to listen. Yeah, I don't know if they, if the, if the spores would stay on the animal like they do on a leaf and it needs moisture because if you've, if you've seen, I don't know if you can see these, where the, the you know, when you have the bay laurel leaf and it's always where, whichever way the leaf lays where water runs is where you see the telltale sign. I don't know if it would be the same on a, when we get out of here today, I'm gonna to call over to UC and ask them because, you know, if it's transferable through like the squirrel and the bird. I know that Mateo has never mentioned that to my knowledge and I've attended, to, you know, so many meetings mm -hmm. that um, that's a very good point, yeah. All right. Um... Well, uh, do we have any other questions? Um, I have Nikki's. There were a couple of hands also... up, but they've gone they've gone down. Oh, okay. Well, maybe they've uh, they had their questions oh. answered. Oh, <laughs> Judith, go ahead, Judith. Go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask your question. Um, I've been treating my oaks religiously ever since we learned about the ability to treat them, and um, the arborists have never mentioned that we should pre. Um, treat ourselves with this gypsum. You know, we have the arborist out, they spray, I clear around the bottom of the tree to get the leaves away and stuff so that they, um, you know, the stuff they spray penetrates well, but nobody's told me I should be spreading gypsum around the base. Can you talk about that for a moment? Uh, that Mateo, you know, we've been doing these since 2007. And in 2019, that's when Mateo started saying, this is another thing we have discovered is, you know, it, it, and none of this is going to protect your tree. It won't stop Phytophthora. It keeps the tree healthier and more resilient in, in case it does get infected. Uh -huh. But it doesn't mean it's a 100%, you'll, you know, it'll never get it. The, the mm -hmm. best thing that Mateo always says is to remove the bay laurels, understanding respect for mm -hmm. riparian corridor where you can't do that. And the distance, the distance is like, within 30 feet, especially if we're talking big, big tree and big oak tree, you know, you don't want to lose a big oak tree. Um, so. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, and Sarah has a comment. So Sarah, I think if I'm reading your 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 comment, you're saying that, that the Cal Fire uh, pathologists are saying that if a wildfire goes through an oak woodland, it doesn't mean that um, those trees that survive are all of a sudden now um, not prone from SOD. They're they're still vulnerable. Is that is that what your statement is? Oh, um, basically the just with speaking with the state pathologists, they were saying, well, you would think that um, if there's a wildfire through the landscape, it's going to reduce the amount of pathogen in the landscape, or it would burn up or kill the pathogen. Um, but that's actually not true. Uh, that it it is able to. <laughs> Severe through wildfire and it's still present and can reinfect after the fire moves through. Well, there's some folks that said um, that it was spread through fog or for underground water sources. So if that's the case, then the wildfire would not be helpful. Yeah, so. yeah, fog and fog drip is a uh, is one consideration. Um. Dan, uh, you have a comment about gypsum. Do you want to just uh, unmute yourself and just um, explain about the gypsum? Yeah, uh, gypsum is a soil conditioner, so it, it influences the pH of the soil. Um, so if it's uh, applied appropriately, um, it, it can help a tree uh, draw nutrients from the soil easier. Um, it's in general, um, it's not a fertilizer, but it, it, it just makes the tree more effective at uh, uptaking the nutrients that are already there. So in general, it's, it's a good thing to do. And so I, I'm, I can't project exactly what uh, Mateo and, and his um, thoughts are on it, but um, effectively, if the tree is able to draw nutrients from the soil easier, um, it will be less stressed and be more receptive to additional treatments or other treatments. So, uh, when that comes oh, well, that's good info. Um, as gypsum is pretty easy and lightweight, um, easy to obtain, easy to apply. So that's a good tip. 
Okay, uh, Dudley has a question. Um, her question is, does addition of Toyon, Manzanita, Madrone to the list of carriers mean that they should be removed from areas with live oaks or only if they are infected? This is just my supposition, but I don't think Mateo is telling people they should take down the Toyons and the Madrones. It's just they've it's become they've discovered it on those plants, which they hadn't before. But then, of course, this is that, you know, this, the testing is becoming further and further out over time and more people are participating. So, no, I don't think he's saying like he does about Bay Laurels. No. But I will also check on that. Yeah. I do know that um, Midpen, uh, Cody Swenthus has told me um, on projects that we're working with um, is that they are kind of targeting the really young tan oaks. So if it's like a sapling tan oak and he, he gave me a dimension, um, uh, then he wants to just remove them. Trees that look like they are, you know, you know a little bit older with a little bigger um, diameter they're leaving, but they're, they're, the tan oaks are just getting decimated um, in the area that you mentioned, the skyline, you know, kind of corridor. Um, it's, it's a real problem for the tan oaks. Um, okay, let's see who else I have. Dudley. Just... Denise, okay. I just wanted to make a quick comment about uh -huh. the um, other species that are infected by uh, Phytophthora morum. Um, it's it's my understanding that you know there's other species like madrone and manzanita uh, are not effective at transferring the disease to oaks um, a lot of it has to do with the pathogen load. we all know covid right we've got enough information it's about pathogen loading and proximity of those trees uh, to be able to transfer the disease at a receptive state um, I don't know enough about how the pathogen uh, transfers from, say, toyons to oaks, but it could be a timing issue where the bay laurel, the, 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 the time that the bay laurel is, uh, the, the, the pathogen is active from bay laurels to oaks is probably the right time for infection to be at its peak uh, based on weather conditions and uh, climate. So uh, that would be my general assumption. Okay. Um, I know in my neighborhood, we have a, a neighborhood of about 300 homes. And um, for the last three or four years, we've done a group agrifos spray. So we find one uh, tree contractor who will come out and spray. And um, you know, we give him all the addresses. He gives us a, a discounted rate and stays in our neighborhood for you know two three days and just sprays you know the tree. So he's very um, it's a very efficient use of his time. And we're getting a lot more trees um, treated you know this way because it's it's kind of organized for the residents. It's it's discounted, um, and so that I think is um, it's been helpful and something that can probably be replicated in in smaller communities. Um, can I say know, in the Sorry, in the old yeah. in the old days, pre-pandemic, uh, there was a time when we had the in-person meetings for the peninsula that I was able to get a discounted buy on the Agrifrost because we were buying in bulk, uh, not not the application. We would get it, deliver it there, and then people would either do it themselves or if they had gardeners or however to to either inject or or spray it. And maybe we could we could do that again if there was enough enough numbers, you know, and that worked. Although the cost of the agrifos, like everything else on earth has gone up. Right, right. Um, okay, and I, I, yeah, can I just ahead. say one last thing which, about this, which is kind of positive. I was asking the lab yesterday because several years back, Mateo was discussing making, um, bringing forth an acorn that would be resistant to Phytophthora. You know, that's always the last resort, you know, that it's so bad, you have to create the entity that would resist it. And actually the lab has found um, the basis for resistance in the acorn, but the UC lab, the plant uh, lab for pathology and mycology is not, that's not their bailiwick. They don't create the acorn, but they have 
delineated the basis for resistance in the acorn, which is a, a big step forward. Hmm. That's really inter interesting. Okay, uh, are there any more hands up? Uh, Casey, do you see any hands? Any more questions? Yeah, Nikki has, <laughs> Nikki, is your hand still up or is it not? Yeah. Up? Okay. <laughs> Um, here, I'll lower my hand now, but I was just, I guess I just wanted to uh, just sort of caution people to not just like jump in and, and uh, yeah, remove all the toy ons and sword ferns and everything, just because like I said, um, it's, there, there's just a lot of subtlety to this and a lot of more to it than just, um, you know, it's a host, therefore it can infect. And so I, from what I understand is, tan oaks and bay laurels are pretty unique in their ability to transfer it to oak trees um, and to each other. But yeah, it would just be really interesting to hear kind of the latest thinking from the experts on this because I do know that it's always evolving and we're always finding more information. But um, yeah, just caution, <laughs> caution to not just uh, overdo it there because it can lead to a lot more problems than you want, like it's landslides and erosion and all of that. So yeah, keep an understory intact, please. <laughs> yep. Well, and I know that the, the folks on the call who have spent um, time uh, treating their trees, spraying their trees with the agrifos, something that I've noticed and that I've kind of um, reiterated to folks who, you know, asked me what I thought about spraying. I think it's great. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a fertilizer. It has more of a fertilizer, I think, effect to the trees. And it's not like a vaccine or anything like that. But what it does do is it promotes a lot of growth on your oak trees. Um, almost, you know, more than maybe normally a tree, you know, would have on its own without having the treatment. And I warned people that I saw so much growth on my trees that I had, you know, um, call in my tree uh, contractor to come and trim them because I felt that they were getting too big, too heavy. <laughs> and so I'm just, you know, warning you, you don't want to, you know, treat your trees and say, okay, I'm doing the right thing. And then they, they get a little too heavy and then, you know, you lose a big branch or something like that because you were really you know, trying to do the right thing for your trees. So it's kind of, you know, pulling with uh, mother nature. It's a, it's a sensitive balance. So um, I, I've just, you know, acquiesced and said, okay, if I spray my trees, I'm probably going to have to trim them, you know, every other year, they're going to have to be, you know, lightened up a little bit. No, oh, just that being said, that's my, my, my observation. Okay, well, I think we've, we're coming to the end of the questions. Um, and so I'd like to uh, introduce our, our next speaker. Um, Judith Murphy, Murphy is also uh, a local, um, I call her an activist. Um, she is very, um, very involved in the, the conservation committee for many years, Petrola Valley. Um, I think their goal, the Conservation Committee's goal is um, to conserve the rural quality of Portola Valley and also with the, you know, aesthetic rural, rural nature of, uh, you know, the community. They've done a really great job of educating the community. I think that, um, I think that's one of their, their priorities and they've done a good job. Um, Judith and I work together quite a bit um, with fuel reduction becoming, you know, very important and more, more projects. Um, Judith wanted to try to find a really good, you know, balance between fuel mitigation and conservation, um, wildlife and botanical, uh, especially native botanical habitat. And um, there's really educated um, um, people on the conservation committee and their agendas are always, I think, right on and, um, and really useful. Um, and so I wanted her to just kind of present um, what they do, some of the things that they've done that they feel have, have worked uh, to educate the community and um, give, give our group an opportunity to ask her questions. So Judith, go Thanks. right ahead. Thanks, Denise. Um, 
So I'm going to focus sort of on the interface between conservation and fire rather than going into all the various things that the conservation does. As we know, there are lots of groups working on fire prevention and lots of other groups uh, working on native habitat and wildlife. Um, and because of the narrow focus of each of these, many of these groups are either unaware of or uh, indifferent to the effects of their recommendations because they're so focused. Um, you know, the tree huggers want to keep the trees and don't really think much about the fire. And the fire people, of course, are responsible for fire. And so that's their goal. And they often get very um, fixated. So I, I think there's this sweet spot <laughs> between denuding uh, fire clearance and, and overzealous nativism. And for the last five years or so, conservation has sort of seen a need to be active in that space. So in fall of 2021, um, long before this heightened interest uh, in prevention that by the average Joe, all of the fire departments knew about and cared about it, the average citizen was thinking about earthquakes, not fire in general, when they got worried about things. Um, uh, Conservation Committee presented an evening called Balancing Safety and Habitat Preservation at the town center, an evening lecture that was attended by, I think 60 or 70 people. The panel was Denise, who was then the fire marshal, uh, and Eric Abelson, a Stanford wildlife biologist, whose research was at Jasper Ridge. Denise said it was the first time she'd ever been asked to do a presentation that included conservation issues and consideration of habitat. Uh, that video uh, of that event is on YouTube and a link is still on the resources section of the Portola Valley Conservation Committee webpage. Uh, I skimmed through it recently getting ready for this presentation and it's still worth watching, it's held up well. So at, at some point near the end of my talk, um, Denise will put up a screenshot of the links to the various things I'm gonna talk about. And, that, and one of them is for that. Then um, since its inception in 2019, um, the Wildfire Preparedness Committee, which was originally the Ad Hoc Fire Preparation Committee, has had um, a representative from Conservation Committee on it. We, we send informal um, representatives to several of the town committees because I think we should be working um, together with people not going down our own little channels and then suddenly trails is doing something conservation didn't know anything about, et cetera. So we have several informal of these, but we've had formal representation on um, the uh, wildfire preparedness for some time. It was originally Miriam Plunder and now it's Nona Chirello. And so monthly at our meetings, we get a little um, report about what's happening there and, and when we think we have something to contribute. We tell that member, you know, offer our services to this, or sometimes they ask us to review various things that they're working on. Um, so we spend a lot of time uh, and energy and homework uh, creating or contributing to projects and documents that balance this uh, creation of defensible space and the protection of local natives and wildlife. There was a low fire hazard native plant list that we created in November of 2020, uh, committed by, uh, sorry, created by a subcommittee of the Conservation Committee. And uh, a link to that is there. Uh, there's an underst understory habitat in defensible space, an illustrated brochure that was produced by another hardworking subcommittee that, that um, hit the webpage September 2021. That was originally thought of as a brochure, an illustrated brochure to pass out, but like many things now it's uh, in electronic form. Uh, and an excellent comprehensive document <coughs> called Wildfire Risk Mitigation in the Portola Valley Canyons was created by a working group led by Jennifer Eustra, who lives on that canyon and Nona Chirello. Conservation had input into the language and content, uh, increasing its um, focus on the effects on habitat, wildlife, and erosion uh, uh, that was presented to the Wildlife Preparedness Committee in August of 2022. And um, 
why don't you put up that that thing, Denise, now with the links? So I'm not going to go into the content of those various things, but they they have attempted each in its own way, depending on the focus, to look precisely at that. How do you do a good job of fire prevention and a good job at uh, protecting essential habitat? They're all on the website of the Conservation Committee page of the, of the Portola Valley Town website. And um, the thing that Denise will post is, um, and screen share for you is uh, linked directly to those things individually. So conservation also serves in an advisory capacity to the Portola Valley Public Works Department on care of the town's open spaces and parks. And in that capacity, we focus not only on <clears throat> control of invasives, protections of the ponds, the frogs, encouragement of wildflowers, native vegetation and wildlife, but also on eliminating fire ladders and protecting only islands of brush. Once again, we changed what we were doing 15 or 20 years ago because of an increasing awareness of, of fire issues. We want those properties to be a good example of both beautiful and responsible land management so that as the residents of the town go to our local parks and spaces, what they see around them is a model of what they should be doing. We serve in a, uh, an advisory capacity to the Architectural Review Board in Portola Valley. We review the landscaping proposals uh, in applications for new construction and major remodels. We focus on preserving wildlife corridors, protecting heritage trees, removing invasive plants, and encouraging landscaping with native low water use fire plants. And to that list, we've added low fire risk plants so that we are trying to keep um, the fire issue in mind. It's not our task. And one of our, you know, we don't want to become the people people uh, ask about fire issues because that's not our expertise, but we want to make sure that we're being realistic in our recommendations about what we think people should do in terms of, um, how many trees they have, what's the fire ladder look like, what's the contiguous canopy, all those things that we didn't use to pay attention to and now we do. Um, we focus on education. We have a wildlife habitat award that we copied actually after Woodsides. Um, monthly on the local PV forum, we post uh, a tip of the month about what you should be doing in your garden to encourage natives, et cetera. And another one on what's blooming now um, the local native blooming plants, ones that would do well in your garden to try to encourage people to plant those things rather than um, some fancy Connecticut plant that they really love because their mother had it in her garden. Um, and we also do community work days. We have an annual broom pull where we uh, rally the forces. We provide the, the uh, weed wrenches and the gloves and we assign people to various um, streets in town where the right-of-ways have become more thick with broom. And that's been going on for 20 years and we had a dramatic impact um, on, the, on the broom that's along there. And unfortunately, the impact has gone from, now we don't have 20 feet brooms, we have a whole we have millions of little brooms because the seed bank is so uh, persistent that it uh, they keep coming up, but we, we, uh, we persevere. It's rather Sisyphusian. We don't have any uh, beginning of an idea that we'll be able to get rid of the broom. But once again, it's partly to set a good example to encourage people to get the broom off their own private land uh, where we don't, don't go, obviously, in the broom pool. Um, we have done some work days at Frog Pond, getting rid of the weedy underbrush, you know, taking it back so they're just islands of this. And we have residents, we have scouts, and occasionally we've had firemen join us if they're free when we're doing this, which adds a lot of, uh, to the scouts love that when the firemen come out and are working alongside them. So that's, that's pretty much it. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Well, thanks, Judith. Uh, you, you guys have done you know, a wonderful job um, I just want to 
you know, add a little bit. Um, the conservation committee also was very helpful uh, to me when we would have just local projects that we were doing um, and they would go in ahead of our project um, and passionately flag any sensitive plants for us so that we could, you know, work in tandem uh, in the conservation and, and the fuel reduction. And I thought that was a really great uh, example of really good community collaboration, um, which is sometimes um, far and few between. Um, their list of native plants, uh, Fire Safe, um, and the Conservation Committee have always shared their list of native plants and are kind of uh, synonymous. Um, and um, they're a great resource, lots of great pictures. Um, your, your monthly kind of bulletins, I should probably um, share that, even though I know we have these microclimates around the county, but um, we could always put on there that this is kind of what's happening in Woodside and Petrola Valley. And, send it out to people because people are curious about, you know, what's in their garden. And um, so I'm happy uh, to do that. Yeah, we don't feel protective about those at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Feel free to share. Right, no, it's great information, very well done. Um, and, and that's why I wanna, I mean, commend you on your education because if people are educated, especially with a, you know, a pictorial aspect, um, uh, it, it, I think it's it's well served and it, it really works. Um, and I encourage everybody on the call who has a neighborhood that's full of broom um, to do a broom pull. And so I copied what Portola Valley did and did a broom pull in um, in my neighborhood and the people loved it. I mean, we had all yeah. ages out there and um, I still see remnants of people, even if it's not organized, will pull broom and kind of leave it on the side of the road you know, and either somebody puts it in the recycle bin or we end up, you know, chipping it. Um, so all the programs, you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. Portrilla Valley Conservation Committee has created some really great things that can be easily replicated. And Judith, I'm not sure if you're willing to share your, <clears throat> your email if people have questions. Um, oh, sure. Okay. I can it's put it in the chat for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so also so, in the chat, there's a question here in the chat I see uh, from Dudley says, has conservation committee looked at conservation of water and specifically on the possibilities of collecting and saving winter rainwater for later use in irrigation and gray water uses? Um, uh, yes, in we have in minor ways, we haven't had, had a real program around this because the, the consensus in general is it's not cost effective to do rainwater catchment in areas where you don't have um, replacement of the water in your barrels <laughs> with some frequency. So back East and in the Midwest, it's a terrific strategy because you know, they consider a drought three weeks without rain and their, their barrels are constantly filling. And so they can constantly be using them during the dry times or in areas where they wanna water more than the, than the regular rainfall takes care of. Here, actually, I've got 16 rain barrels lined up behind my house because I love the, I love the concept, and it's like having a compost heap. You know, it doesn't really solve the world's problems, but it's so uh, rewarding and magical. And they fill like crazy. It doesn't take much to fill a rain barrel in a big rain because our roofs, the runoff from your roof, does it quite readily. Um, and then I use it to extend my my wet season, basically, I, I water, I have a very small garden that I water, pots on decks, that kind of thing. Most of my land is, is not landscape. And um, it carries me through June, July, depending on the year and how stingy I am with the water and what I've put in my pot th that year. Um, but then it, it, I'm high and dry and no rain comes to refill the barrels. So it's a wonderful strategy um, for, for that, but it's not, it's not effective in the way that it is in the Midwest and, and back East. I think one more interesting issue here now, and we see it with this big rain is many of the municipalities have rules against um, putting anything in the waterways, slowing that might slow the waterway. And I understand they don't want stuff coming down and plugging the culverts, et cetera. 
but what we know, they also have rules about trying to keep all the water that falls on your property on your property. So those of us with drainage ditches and uh, it's not it's not appropriate to call them creeklets because they're not really. They just they're bone dry nine months of the year, and nothing riparian will grow there. And they flood like crazy. They're always running in the rains, and they really fill for 12 to 24 hours in the big rains, that it would make sense to me to have little gabions or something along these things to hold the water on your own land a little more. It would reduce the load on the, you know, the water carrying systems that get overwhelmed in these big, big rains. Not much, but if lots of us could do little tiny versions of this, it might make some difference. So that these rains have sort of reawakened an interest in that for me. And I'm, I'll talk at the next conservation, I'll just raise the issue at the next conservation meeting and see, talk to public works. And because public works will hear that and go, oh my God. And yet the whole, this whole 30 by 30 concept of doing whatever you can in every little way um, to conserve water among other things, uh, it seems like it's time to look at that more. Yeah, and we might be able to, um dig in and use some of our uh, our individual resources here to find out if there's any current programs of rain barrels, you know, either from the state um, or anything like that. Um, the water but, districts have, have done that. Many yeah. of the water districts have uh, given low cost barrels or uh, rebates, you know, if you do this, they'll give you a barrel or they've had a contest for a barrel, that sort of thing. E yeah. uh, East Bay Mud ha has been, at least a few years back, was doing a fair amount of that. Yeah, maybe we can um, lobby Cal Water and ask them if um, you know that there, if there's enough people interested, if they could, um, if they could maybe initiate something for. Right. for but us. once again, it's, it's not the it's not the kind of solution that works as well in our climate as it does everywhere else. Yeah. Okay. So we have some uh, questions and um, and people are chatting. Um, we got some really great answers um, about broom. So um, PV loves to pull broom if if you can, but on a lot of our fuel reduction projects, you know, it's getting chipped. And so the question is, if you chip it, will it? Um, are you spreading broom? And so the consensus, you know, we're seeing here is that if it has the seed pot on it, um, then you probably are spreading it. So you want to get it before it goes to seed. Um, Sarah, did you want to elaborate? Just unmute and just elaborate on this. Oh, um, you know, I think Nikki also covered it. Just you know, if you're if you're chipping in the late summer or fall, you are spreading it because the seed's viable. Um, the spring, right. spring is your time, but I've always had a problem ch chipping broom because it's, you know, so light and fluffy. It doesn't really right. eat well for the chipper. Yeah. Well, the yeah. problem solves itself a little bit because the, the only time of year you can get the damn stuff out of the ground is in the spring when it's wet. That around here, we have such tough concrete soil that if you wait till June and try to get the broom out, you know, it's a, an exercise in futility. So the broom pull that we have in Portola Valley is traditionally the first weekend in March. And they're, they're in the drought, there've been a few years where it was already a little too dry to have it be easy. But if you go out there now, it's like pulling it out of a souffle. You, you know, the little ones come up just, and even the big ones, if you have a weed ranch, you can get big honk and broom out of the soil when it's this wet without too much trouble. So that the timing is everything. And then when the soil is that wet is before the broom has, has come close to getting to seed. So it, it's sort of a package deal. If you, if you take it out at the time, it's easy to get it out. You don't have the problem of spreading it with the seeds. Right, and, uh, and the other thing too is um, sometimes when we chip, we can chip into an enclosed uh, truck and then whatever your you know, your, your chipping can be enclosed and then um, brought to a refuge area. So that refuge area, which um, which is, helps as well. So, but broom, broom is a problem. I'm, I'm glad everybody is, is, is trying to tackle it. Um, so David, does that, does that answer your question on broom?
Yes, thank you. Okay, okay <laughs> good. Um, David's doing a very good job in Hillsboro on the broom eradication. So uh, I'm glad he was able to ask his question. Um, okay, are, do we have to add to David's uh, work on broom? Because thank you so much. That is awesome that you're doing that. Um, but just, yeah, to clarify, it, if you're pulling it and it's in spring, I literally, you can literally just like make little piles of it and it will just compost. Cause like Sarah said, it's kind of, it's so, um, it's more herbaceous than woody. So it's not really great for chipping in that way. Cause it will clog up and kind of, yeah, chippers aren't really made for non woody things. Um, but yeah, as long as you're pulling it before it's flowering, hopefully, then you really can just make little compost heaps of it or if it's already flowering or has even immature seeds because I've seen it continue to mature as it lays there in the sun um because it's it's sneaky like that you could take it like Denise said put it in like an industrial kind of green waste system because that gets so hot that it will kill the seeds um so that's what I do in the past anyway thanks Thank you very much. I appreciate those the extra addition. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're doing a large fuel reduction project, I know Woodside and uh, the parks, um, they've put it in piles and, and burned it as well. So, um, right. That's yeah. even better. So, or uh, my, I also my, just want to say, like, mowing it before it flowers, like, even if you can't pull all of it, because that's really not feasible for most people, at least it prevents it from producing even more seed. So I don't actually think it's a complete waste of time to mow it, even though it's a perennial, so it can come back. Cause at least you're not adding thousands of more seeds to the seed bank cause the broom seeds last for decades in the soil. So yeah, anyway, <laughs> enough on that. <laughs> what okay. the problem with the mowing is if, it, when it comes back up, it comes up multi-trunk. So if it's an area where you have any hope of getting in with a weed wrench or something, that next year getting it with a reed wrench might be much, much harder because it's multi-trunk as opposed to single trunk. But yeah, as a, as a reduction of seed strategy, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, only on these roads where we're not allowed, you know, yeah, I'm talking more like roadsides because what I see is kind of the worst yeah. of both worlds where you mow it and it's after it's flowered. So then you're making yes. it harder to pull up. Plus it's producing a, a huge amount of seeds. <laughs> So that's why I'm just like, yeah, timing, 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 as with so many things, it's really valid to look at your timing. Um, Michael Barber has his hand up and I wanna thank him. He posted a link for um, uh, free rain barrels. So um, make sure you look at the chat and uh, Michael, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, make your comment, please. Just wanted to add to what Judith was saying. Um... Yeah, rain barrels don't really work around here. I do it myself. Um, they're, they're depleted pretty quickly. They don't get replenished. Um, but the stormwater aspect of it, to do this point, anything you can do to keep water on your property, the better. So, I mean, one of the things I do, I've only got two rain barrels. I often drain them out. If I know there's more stormwater coming, I'll drain them out during a dry period. So anyway, um, and they're not necessarily free at that um, website, uh, Flows to the Bay, but they, they have, comp, um, you know, like raffles where you can get free ones, but they're not that expensive. It's, it's a source of getting rain barrels. Mm -hmm. Well, after all this stormwater and the, the fact that our county is now under a declaration of a disaster, maybe there'll be rain barrels uh, <laughs> available. Um, I'm assuming there'll be other mitigations that um, are available for homeowners to try to prevent some of this um, damage. But um, yeah, they're all, these are all really great conservation um, items to, to discuss. Okay, uh, who else has a question or a comment or a helpful tip? Um, let's see. Um, I wanted to just comment on one thing that is uh, kind of repeats itself and is a problem is planting in the right of way. So this time of year, we need all of our drainage swales um, to stay clear. And if people have planted in the right of way, which is that area in front of their house that kind of, you know, is no man's land, 
um, you know, the roots and things are interfering with the drainage soils. Um, you know, the leaves are clogging them, the roots are clogging them. That happens to be the same area where people potentially plant uh, underneath the pg e power lines. So the right of way is really that sacred ground. You shouldn't be planting vegetation there um, because it really does interfere with the infrastructure of our, our neighborhoods and becomes a, a safety um, issue and can cause a lot of damage. So I just wanna throw that out there. I think that's something for the towns to really start uh, enforcing a little more. And, um, and I've mentioned it to them quite a few times. Um, and probably the county as, as well. So I think people could should just be cognizant of that in their neighborhood. Um, so, uh, okay, Casey, any more questions? No, I don't see any, Denise. Okay. 